Where does this division fragmentation come from, particularly when the experiences of creativity and the uh, deployment of imagination has such similar experiential and structural form in both science and arts? Well, one reason that they've diverged is because people don't talk to each other and the disciplines don't talk to each other. Our barriers are far too high. Another reason is that um, some of the great early 19th century hopes for artistic communication of science and artistic um, co-fruitful development with science um, have not come to fruition because of lack of commutation. Let me just read you a little bit of William Wordsworth um, here. This is, this is Wordsworth in, um, that I quote in the first chapter of the, of the book from his preface to the third edition of Lyrical Ballads. Um, this, this tells us something, by the way, of just how close poetry and science, or natural philosophy as it was then in the early 19th century, was. Um, another example is Humphrey, uh, Davy and, and Coleridge um, helping each other with their poems and experiments. But here we go. Here's Wordsworth writing in about 1820. The remotest discoveries of the chemist, the botanist, the mineralogist will be as proper objects of the poet's art as any upon which it can be employed. If, he says, if the time should ever come when these things shall be familiar to us and the relations under which they are contemplated by the followers of these respective sciences shall be manifestly and palpably material to us as enjoying and suffering beings. <laughs> it's a very Wordsworthy sentence. Science has to be communicated, its symbols have to be enjoyed commonly, manifestly felt in affect as well as cognition, in other words, as enjoying and suffering beings. At that point, so if everyone feels and enjoys both the despair and the, and the great joy of, of science discovery, then you can write poems about it. But not if that hasn't happened. And yet we continue to present science as if it were some clean little polished casket of objects of knowledge. And that is never going to do it for us. So where do I hope all this might go? Of course, you know, this is a small drop in an ocean of contributions to um, the dialogue between arts, humanities, sciences. I think, I hope for a world in which in our academic institutions and our public world of thought, we talk about this more, we make it much more democratic, and we're far more open about the twists and turns of the creative process. That, I mean, there are even consequences of this for mental health. Um, here's one thing I've learned, uh, that no one who reflected deeply on this has ever thought that, that creative imagination in science is devoid from emotion. On the contrary, the affective and emotional ride entangled with the cognitive all the way through. David Hume was good on this. Actually, David Hume was very clear. He said, if you, th if you think you're thinking with pure thought, then think again. It's just another type of emotion, I assure you. But the medieval philosophers were, I, th I found that there's a bit of medieval philosophy in the book as well. And that's really because I think the 13th century might have been the last time at which people had the uh, last period in which people had the time and the discipline of self-reflection, um, of metacognition, which is a word that's come back recently in education theory, I'm delighted to say, uh, reflecting on one's own cognitive processes to see that emotion and, uh, and thought run, run in parallel. So I'm hoping for a world that's more honest about that. Secondly, I'm actually hoping for a world that's a bit more creative. And in, in my formation as a scientist, I've realised that I don't think in my PhD, in my graduate studies, certainly not my undergraduate studies, I can't remember a single hour seminar or minute on which we were encouraged to reflect on where we're going to get our scientific ideas from. And yet, uh, the difference between ordinary science and great science is is the radical innovation, the degree to which ideas are radically innovative. Um, so we should talk about that more. I think the third thing is, what I've learned, is that ideas, really fresh ideas, don't tend to come from ploughing a deep, single, high-walled, disciplinary furrow. 
they come, as we've already discovered in these stories of, of creativity, they come tunneling through the unconscious. As several people have said, um, you know, metaphor is the gateway to the unconscious. And science actually thinks metaphorically all, all, all the time. But of course, the, the, the greater the distance of the metaphor, um, the greater is the energy of tension that can feed through into the problem we're working on now feed on as rich and broad a cultural basis as, as possible. It's not a new idea. Um, Isaac Barrow, Newton's contemporary, I'll read you something he said. This is from the 17th century. He can hardly be a good scholar who is not a general one, for one part of learning doth confer light upon another. Not sure I really needed to write a 350-page book after those two lines from Barrow. It's a kind of kind of footnote to Barrow, really. Um, but, uh, but that's the, uh, that's the best of the early modern conception of how ideas form. And of course, there are wonderful links in that period. Um, Pat Warper, as of English at Durham, who I knew well when I started writing the book, pointed out to me that the coincident conception of experimental method and the early English novel in the 17th century is not a coincidence. The artistic form of the novel and the scientific form of experimental science have a deep common conceptual birth um, in, in that wonderful century. That's just one example of the themes, entangled themes that go on through, through, uh, through, through the book. So I think all that uh, in, in the form of graduate education or oh, school education uh, would be lovely to see.